Econ 112. So welcome to the second part of the course. So we just finished all the stuff for um, the first midterm. So the first midterm, we went over a lot of the foundational language. We then went to production possibility frontiers. And we went to supply and demand graphs and equilibrium. And then the elasticity of supply, demand, cross price elasticity, and income elasticity. Now we're going to move into the second part of the course. So this is the information in between the first midterm all the way up to the second midterm. And then we're going to have a third part, which is the second midterm till the final. So in this one, we're going to be looking at a lot of the consumer surplus and producer surplus things. We're also going to be looking at externalities, pollution, taxes, and a bunch of very interesting ways that we approach goods and services. So I hope you enjoy this part as much as I do. Honestly, it's probably my favorite set of chapters that we end up covering in this class. So with that, let's go ahead and jump right on into chapter five. So let me let me screen share. All right, so with that, we're going to be talking about efficiency and equity today. So what does it mean to be efficient and what does it mean to be equitous? So what are the goals? What do I really want you to be able to get from this chapter? First, I would love for you to be able to describe alternative methods of allocating scarce resources. So when we only have a few of something, there has to be a way to figure out how to divvy it or how to distribute it. So there's a lot of alternative methods for that and being able to describe what them are or what they are is going to be important for you. Next is going to be explaining the connection between first, demand, marginal benefit, and defined consumer surplus. We've already covered the first two parts of that in previous chapters, but now we're gonna be talking about the subject of consumer surplus. And what does that mean in the format that we've already kind of established before? Then on the supply side, we're gonna be looking at the difference between supply, marginal cost, and defined producer surplus. Okay, after that, we're going to explain the conditions under which markets are efficient or inefficient. So we're gonna look at this consumer surplus. We're gonna look at this producer surplus. We're gonna put them together into total surplus plus and start to analyze, are we being efficient or not? Is there deadweight loss up in the system? Then we're going to describe some of the main ideas about fairness that exist in the literature. So first off, let's start with an easy one. I think this one's always kind of neat and it's the way to divvy scarce resources or how they might be allocated. So I'm going to go through each one of them one by one. So don't worry about memorizing them right now, but we're going to have like market price, command, majority rule, contest, first come first serve, lottery, personal characteristics, and force. So let's talk about that. First off is market price. This is the, probably the one that you are most familiar with, right? Sometimes when we're, when we're trying to allocate a scarce resource, we have to put a price tag on it. If there's only so many cups of coffee you can make at your coffee shop, you're going to have to set a price so it's equal to about the number of customers that you can handle because you're going to want to sell everything that you have, but you don't want to sell it for too cheap either. When markets allocate scarce resources, the people who get the resources are the ones who are willing to pay that market price. So say it's $3 for a cup of coffee. Well, if you're not willing to pay that $3 for the cup of coffee, then you're not the one that it's allocated to. It's allocated to the ones who are willing. Most of the scarce resources that you supply get allocated by market price. Like these are the ones we know. You go to the store, market price. You go to the bookstore, market price. You go to the tea shop, market price. You can tell I have such an interesting life by the few places that I tend to go, right? The coffee shop, market price. So you sell your labor services within the market, right? You sell your services, you work, they give you a wage. With that wage, you buy most of the things that you consume in markets, which support other people to get their wages for their labor services, and the whole system's interconnected. For most goods and services, the market does a pretty good job. I'd say probably about 90% of things, the market allocates them. All right, mar market price works. But that's not the only way that we can allocate things. And it doesn't answer every question that we might have about the system. Let's talk about command systems. So command systems allocate resources by the order of someone in authority. Um, let's say you have a job, right? So I used to work at Staples. I would have a manager named James. Let's talk about James this time. James liked to make music videos and didn't show up to work all that much, but okay, that's James. So he was the manager. Um, as me, who was working in easy tech or for times, sometimes cashier or sometimes in office supplies, there, there would be someone commanding me and telling me what to do. It would allocate if I was in easy tech that day, it would allocate it if other people are supposed to be working on stock that day, it would allocate if people are supposed to be registering people. And that's a command system. When labor or any other sorts of goods or services are allocated by someone telling them where to go. 
right? Command systems work really well in organizations that have clear lines of authority. If you know you have a manager and that's the person that you're supposed to listen to, that's a clear line of authority and it tends to work fairly well at organizing labor. Um, in this class, if, if we were in person, I'd typically have us do a lot of group activities and I would organize people into groups because there's a clear line of authority. I'd have the authority to tell you which group to go to. But it's not great for the entire economy. You can't build an entire economy based off of one person telling you where something needs to go because it's not an interconnected feature that works very well sometimes. So we also have the idea of majority rule. This one we're probably very familiar with lately because it is an election season, right? So we do a lot of voting. Um, majority rule allocates resources by the way the majority of voters choose. So if you're really into local elections like I am, you might know that we have some business improvement districts or different sort of business zones around Edwardsville where we have to allocate some of the land that gets, gets tax write-offs or things like that to try to incentivize new businesses in. And you can vote on that in local elections or, or give your opinion and things. So it's a way of allocating goods and services by vote. So we use these for really big decisions a lot of the time, like elected officials. Who do we have that we are electing? Um, there's also tax rates. So do we have a tax increase? If you need to fund a new bus system, you need a tax to be able to pay for the buses, right? Does the city pass the, that tax or not? Um, things that are private and public use. So if we're going to have a city owned water source like we do in the city of Edwardsville, they own their own water treatment facility. What's, what's up with that? Uh, tax dollars should be used for defense or health care. Like the, these are different sorts of things that we have public opinion on and there is some sort of majority voting rule for it. Majority rule works well when the decisions affect a lot of people and the self-interest is to use the resources efficiently. So for example, when we're voting for candidates, we have to look at two different candidates and if it affects millions and millions and millions of people, majority rule kind of works well because it says, okay, this is what the majority of people would like. This is the sort of package that they're happy with. Now we have to think that everybody has the self-interest that we want it to be as efficient as possible. So we want two candidates that are going to do their job and use all their resources. If we have at least that supposition or, or Assumption, that's the word I was looking for, assumption. Forgot the word today. Um, if we have that assumption that we're trying to do things efficiently, the majority rule in between big decisions that affect people are just one way of having one bundle of goods or another bundle of goods based upon the most people who want it. It's fairly efficient for, for big time decisions. Now we have other uh, situations such as contests. So contests are pretty cool. You, you kind of know like the Oscars, right? Um, I always forget, what are the Oscars for? Let's, Oscars. Academy Awards, Technical Merit of the Industry, Entertainment. So that doesn't say music. So I'm assuming Oscars are not music. Uh, so probably film or something like that. I'm terrible about these award things. I really don't know what they're for, but there's some sort of contest, right? And we allocate it to a winner, or we allocate an award to a winner or a group of winners. So these are things like sporting events. These are things like trying to have the coolest film at the Oscars. Um, contests work well when the efforts of the players are hard to monitor and reward directly. So let's say that we have a new movie coming out. We might have really great production assistants. We might have really great actors and actresses. We might have a really great production staff. We might have really good financial backers who are supportive of everything. We might have great graphical artists. But when someone goes to the movies, you sit there and you say, wow, that's a good movie or not. You don't necessarily think about the thousands of people who are involved in different parts of this project and what individual piece they made because it's very difficult for me to tell you what good to a movie every single production assistant had, right? Or every, what's the marginal value of having um, actors? Brad Pitt, that's an actor, I think. Uh, Brad Pitt versus Tom Cruise, yeah. Um, I don't know what the marginal benefit of one of the ones over the other is. I don't know, I just know this is a good movie or not. So if it's really hard to figure out the efforts of the individual players, then sometimes a contest based on the overall product is nice. Then we have the idea of first come first serve. You all know this one, you go into a store, you need a calculator because calculators are cool, right? So you're going in and you're going to buy your calculator and there are only like six or seven calculators on the shelf. Who gets the calculator? 
the first person to pick it up and take it to the register, right? Um, there's also the idea of like casual restaurants, right? So these are first come first serve on tables. Uh, you, you go to a Panera or I think they're called St. Louis Bread Company here. So you go to a St. Louis Bread Company um, and you decide to just go pick a table and you go sit at it. Well, you were the first one there, uh, you, you get that table. Supermarkets, first come first serve at checkouts. You go to the different checkout lines at the Aldi and you go to the one with the shortest line. First person there, that's the first one who gets served. The next person lines, the next one to get served, so on and so forth. So it's when these are really good when we can put people in a sequence, right? We can have a sequence of orders of when they check out. We have a sequence of when they walk into the door to grab a table. That's when these this allocation method is the best. All right, then there's lottery systems. So lotteries end up allocating resources to those with the winning number or something like that. When there's no effective way to distinguish between potential users, if I just know, oh, I have 500 people who would like a million dollars, it's really hard for me to know all the details of those, all those people. I don't, I don't know who needs it, who doesn't need it. I don't know what sort of marginal benefit they'd have, what they do with it. Sometimes it's just best to have a lottery system where I just draw the number out of a hat, right? So these are used at some airports. Um, these are used for some marathons to get spots in marathons. For example, like the Boston Marathon, it's so hard to get into that they have to like draw lotteries on who's allowed to get into. Um, let's see, other good lotteries, the, the, the Powerball, right? So allocating these are sometimes just people who come up lucky or not. And this is, this is good when we can't really tell the difference between different types of users. Then we have personal characteristics. So personal characteristics allocate resources to those with the right characteristics. For example, people choose dating partners. Um, you have Tinder, right? You, you download Tinder, you go through and you look for people that like have similar interests to you ideally. Um, this is making a judgment or, and allocating resources based off of personal characteristics of it. Um, but this method also can get used in unacceptable ways, right? This is also the idea of discrimination. So some businesses who don't listen to discrimination law might be like, hmm, I don't like this person because they are such and such color. I don't like this person because of their gender, or I don't like this person because of their political beliefs or their disability or their age. Well, those would be unacceptable ways of using personal characteristics and, and it causes some forms of discrimination, which is kind of a little different from like the, the Tinder situation in times too. So this one is, is difficult to measure and it's, it's difficult in figuring out when it's always most acceptable and when it's not acceptable, right? So we have personal characteristics. Then we have the idea of force. So force is the last one. This is just the idea that um, you just tell people what to do, right? Uh, we see this a lot in times of war um, and when we're changing different types of legal frameworks um, and we just say, hey, you do this now and you live in this area and you do that. This is not really the preferred method of allocating resources, but it's one way that it can happen. And this involves theft or taking property of goods and services without consent and giving it to others based upon whatever the person who's establishing force says. So it's an effective way of allocating resources, um, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily efficient or liked. So these are our different sort of ways of, of allocating things because we have to allocate things. We don't buy everything. Sometimes they're awarded by other things. I can't buy an Oscar. I can't, I can't buy, I don't know. Um, I, can't, I can't buy the Panthers an actual Super Bowl win. Believe me, I would if I could, but I can't. I'm a Panthers fan, by the way. Woo, go Panthers. Carolina Panthers, if, if you're not aware of which one. Um, so yeah, okay, all right. So let's talk about willingness to pay. So we've already talked about demand. We know we have our downward sloping demand line. This is because of the law of demand. So as prices go up, I want less of something. And as prices go down, I want more of something because we have some sort of value for it. That implicit value can be connected to what the prices for them are. So value is kind of what we get from something. Now, the value of one more unit of something, ah, I dropped the mouse is the marginal benefit of a good or service. So if I have, what do I have today? I have a lot of scrunchies. If I have 
one more scrunchie, how much additional benefit do I get out of this scrunchie? What is my marginal benefit? How much extra happiness do I get out of this scrunchie? If I say it's about 30 cents worth and a scrunchie costs about 30 cents, well, then, I, then I'll buy it. Or if it costs less than 30 cents, I'll buy it because there's some sort of marginal benefit. This marginal benefit we sometimes measure as our maximum price. So that very first scrunchie, I might be willing to pay like $4 for because my hair is annoying me and in my face, right? So that's a maximum price to be willing to pay for that one. Now, once I have one scrunchie, I don't really need two scrunchies because I can't pull off the Princess Leia buns look very well. So maybe the maximum price that I'm willing to pay is equal to the marginal benefit I'd get out of a second scrunchie, which isn't very much. So maybe I'd only be willing to pay like 50 cents for the second scrunchie after I pay $4 for the first one. So we have to think about the, the willingness to pay for the next of a good or service. So the marginal benefit is just the willingness to pay for one more. And it's the maximum price that you're willing to pay for one more. Now, willingness to pay determines demand, right? If, if um, scrunchies are $4 and society will buy 30 of them, well, then they'll demand 30 of them at $40 or $4, right? A demand curve is just the idea of marginal benefits curves. It's just charting how much we're willing to pay for one more of something. So I might be willing to pay that, but, but you're going to need to drop the price for me to buy that 31st scrunchie, right? So we have individual demand and we have market demand. So I haven't really distinguished in between the two up until now, but you have an individual demand curve. You have a curve of how much you're willing to pay and how much you're willing to buy for goods and services. The thing is, everybody else does too. So my demand curve for scrunchies plus the next person's demand curve for scrunchies plus the next person's demand curve for scrunchies. When we add them all together, we have the market demand. It's the total amount that society wants at each price point. The relationship between the price of a good and the quantity demanded by one person, well, we're going to call that individual demand if it's one person in the market. If we start thinking about multiple people demanding, so how much I want scrunchies and how much Heather wants scrunchies and how much the other Heather wants scrunchies. I have no idea what this is a reference to, but my professors like 15 years ago did, did that. I think it's like clueless or something. I don't know. I haven't seen it. Something about Heathers. Anyways, um, if everybody has a demand for scrunchies, when I add them all together, how much does society want at each price point? Then we're talking about market demand. So let's talk about what that looks like or what really the difference is. So in this one, on I see that we have an area for three different graphs. On the left graph, we have the demand curve from Lisa. At $2.50, Lisa will buy zero slices of pizza because that's getting a little outside of her price range. Like $2.50 for one slice of pizza, like mm, better be good pizza. We see that as the price decreases, she wants more and more of pizza. So at $2, she wants 10. At $20, she wants $1.50. Or at $1.50, she wants 20. At $1, she wants 30. And at 50 cents, she wants 40. Okay, all right. So we know what her individual demand curve looks like. At a dollar, she would like 30 slices of pizza. Next, we have Nick. So Nick, maybe he's a little more price sensitive than Lisa was. So Lisa at $2 started buying 10 slices of pizza. But Nick at $2 still doesn't want any pizza. He's saying, you know, maybe, maybe that's too pricey for me. No, thank you. Maybe at $1.50, he's still buying zero. But maybe at a dollar, he'll buy 10 slices of pizza. So Lisa at a dollar is willing to buy 10 slices of pizza and Nick at a dollar is willing to buy 10 slices of pizza. Well, what does that mean for the market? Well, the market is just adding up all the individuals. So it looks something like this at a dollar, where at a dollar, we're gonna have Lisa's 30 slices and we're gonna have Nick's 10 slices. So the market, if we assume that they're the only two people in the market, the market would like 40 slices of pizza. It ends up looking like this. So notice that we kind of have this weird knob in the middle. So at 250, no one wants pizza. But in between 250 and two dollars, when we start to reduce that price, Lisa wants pizza. So we have the 10 pizzas that Lisa wants. And then when we go from two dollars to dollar fifty, Lisa wants more pizzas. We add in 10 more. So we have 20 total pizzas that are demanded by the economy. But up until this point, only Lisa is demanding pizza. Now we notice once we start to get below $1.50, Nick wants pizza too. So at $1.50, we have the 20 pizzas that Lisa demands. But when we go to a dollar, we have the 30 pizzas that Lisa demands plus the 10 pizzas that Nick demands. So we're adding these together. Isn't that kind of cool? 
So this is a horizontal summation. Horizontal summation means that we're just adding these two lines together. We go to the price on, on our y-axis, we find the price, we add up one person's and then the next person's and we stack them horizontally like that. So now we need the idea of consumer surplus. Notice that I had said that earlier. It's actually a really cool concept. It's the excess benefit that you receive from a good over the amount that you paid for it. So I benefit, like the maximum amount that I pay for the first scrunchie is like $4, right? The scrunchies aren't $4. Maybe I bought this for a dollar. Okay, well, if I bought this for a dollar and I was willing to pay $4, I got a darn good deal. Well, if I got a good deal, that good deal is equal to the $3 difference, right? I would have been willing to pay four. Ha ha, they didn't charge me enough. I got $3 of extra bit of happiness because that's that extra $3 I would have been willing to pay for this $1 scrunchie. That extra $3 of happiness, the difference between what I would have been willing to pay and what I actually paid, that's consumer surplus. It's just this excess benefit. So we can calculate consumer surplus as the marginal benefit or value, right? So how much I value, how much I'm willing to pay for the next one of a good minus its price. My $4 of value for the first scrunchie minus its $1 price tag equals $3. That $3, that's my consumer surplus, is measured by the area under the demand curve. So let me show you what that means. So in this one, we had Lisa and Nick, right? Lisa at this point at $2 would have bought 10 slices of pizza. But let's say that pizza is actually a dollar, right? Because when I'm out here in the market demand, I charge a dollar because I would like to sell 40 slices of pizza. Well, for those first 10 slices of pizza, she would have been willing to pay $2. So Lisa's like, oh, I'm getting such a good deal. I would have paid $2 for this 10th slice of pizza, but they're selling it to me for a dollar. Ha, 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 um, they, they could have charged me more, but they didn't. So that extra bit of happiness, the difference between the $2 Lisa was willing to pay and the $1 she, was she did pay, that $1 difference, that's Lisa's consumer surplus. Now, a lot of the time we fill it in like this in green. Consumer surplus is just the difference in between our demand line and the line that represents the price. Notice the line that represents the price is just going to our price on our y-axis and drawing a line all the way across. Everything above that up until the demand line, that's consumer surplus. That's that extra good feeling of, uh, I would have been willing to pay more, but they didn't charge me more. It's that extra bit of happiness for, for consumers. So that we see, we also have that for Nick, and we also have that for the economy. The economy has consumer surplus associated with it. I don't know why I put so many slides in this. So this green part, this is our consumer surplus, right? Now we also need to think about what the revenue is. So if at a dollar, if we go over to the market, well, we have the 30 pizzas that are demanded by Lisa at a dollar and the 10 pizzas that are demanded by Nick at a dollar. That means there's 40 pizzas. This 40 pizzas, so this amount along the quantity, is multiplied by this $1, the amount along the y-axis or the price axis, well, then we get this blue box right here. Now, this should sound familiar to you from the first section. This is what our total revenue is going to be equal, right? Our total revenue is the amount that we're selling times the price we sold it for. So it's just, oops, I, what did I just do? Ah, sorry, I messed up the slides, give me a second. Ah, so this rectangle, this is equal to our total revenue. This is just going to be the $1 times times the 40 pizzas. It's the size of the blue box. So just think about making, you know, the equation for a rectangle. Okay, well, we're actually breezing through this. After this, we end up going to supply a marginal cost. So first we did the consumer surplus, and next we're going to do the producer surplus. Before you go to the next video, stand up, stretch your legs, do everything else, because we're going to jump right back into it with the next lesson.